welcome to another episode of VM End to End, a show where we have a VM skeptic and a VM enthusiast come together to hash out all things Google Cloud VM related. Brian, thanks again for coming. Likewise, I'm excited for this episode. Money matters to everybody. Yeah. Exactly. Last episode, we said we're going to have to talk about costs, what this is going to do to my pockets. And and that's what I want to know, because before this episode, I actually went and filled out a spreadsheet. I listed all of my resources, all of my machines and CPUs. And, and, and then I went and saw how much it would cost to just put that over in the cloud. Yep. And... I know where this is I don't going. know if you're going to be surprised by this. It was way more expensive than just running it on-prem. Yeah. What's so up with that? that? That does happen when you do kind of a straight one-to-one mapping sometimes. Um, and I think the the key thing is where cloud usually saves the most money is through having high utilization of what you're, of the machines you're actually running at the time and changing what you're running over time. So my question back to you is... How did you decide on those machine sizes to put into the spreadsheet and do the math out from? I, I will be honest. I sized it based on if I was purchasing, purchasing a machine today, I would need it to last three to five years. So how much RAM do I need to have for it to be still relevant three to five years from now? How much space? And then also, I need these machines to be able to handle uh, peak workloads that I might not always be op- operating at. And so I had to be able to have CPU and RAM that could handle the worst so case scenario. So most days they're probably way over specified, and then occasionally they're you know kind of hitting their their limits, um, and that's yes. But they <laughs> were cheaper than the cloud. <laughs> like you know what I mean? They were cheaper than the yep. cloud VMs so I was talking about. That's where you know the bulk of the savings. And I think there's some other stuff I want to hit, but the bulk of the savings come from this kind of pay for what you use kind of concept, and you won't. Pay for what you use. I, I hear this. I hear this all the time. And I and I don't quite understand it. I, I just interrupted and you were going to explain it. But I just hear this phrase so much. And I'm like, so yeah. I really want to know. So the, the simplest is, mean? you know, like you turn the machines off when you're not using them. But I, I think it also is a little bit confusing because usage is kind of a broad term. And we use it for actually two different kind of concepts in Google Cloud. There's the pay for specific work done. So like if you're using a cloud storage bucket, like, actually saving an item in the bucket or retrieving it. And then there's this kind of sense of uh, reservations. So the way most of the billing for the VM works is it starts when you make the API call to turn it on. And when you call to turn it off, that's when the billing stops. So it's this kind of like reservation. So when they talk down to the second, pay for what you use, that's what they're exactly. saying in that so, case. Yeah, and we actually do build to the second with a 10-minute minimum. The So when you do the math out for a way over-specified machine, it's going to sit at like 5% usage or something all the time, and all that extra is wasted. Um, and that's what we want to avoid to you know save the most money. The other okay. thing, though... That does make a lot of sense. I, I'm going to jump on a little bit. So when you just do the spreadsheet out, um, you're only focusing on the the computers, Right. And there's a lot more to yeah. it, you know, so, you know, you, you have people's time to set those up, to troubleshoot them when something goes wrong, to respond to failures that might happen. You maybe overbuy for redundancy. You've got to hook them up to a network. You probably have some security boundaries you want to enforce. Maybe you buy a load balancer, all this kind of extra stuff that is actually baked into the cost, you know, at the hourly kind of, or like the per second kind of rate of a cloud VM. Yeah, that really does add up over time. Uh, and okay, and that that's true. Like if I had to factor in people hours and all the rest of this, those costs in in my spreadsheet would go way up. Something I am concerned with though because it seems like a cloud VM is a different mental paradigm. It's a shift in how we have to think about it. So what are the hidden costs or gotchas that come up when people are switching from on-prem yep. and to and like a cloud? lot of moving parts and like we're encouraging you to turn things on and off and maybe run test environments and this other stuff. Um, you hear stories about like, I've got this charge running on some other service that I don't know where it comes from. Um, that I think we've got a pretty good solution for in Google Cloud. So we have a concept of a project and all of the resources live in this project. And so if you, if you delete the project, all the resources will get turned off and not charged for in the future. So I, I want something like that for all of my random oh my subscriptions gosh, in life. <laughs> Um, that would be amazing. There are some kind of not obvious, uh, things that I think are worth paying for or or that, you know, you might not think to include in your, in your estimates. Um, so the, the worth it side, I think it's worth looking into the support options because there's some, some really 
highly trained, really awesome folks on our support team who can help you out when things get into troubleshooting mode. Um, so I think that's worth thinking about. The other one that I, I think is really can be a surprise is network traffic. So inbound networking is all free and kind of part of the deal, but you do pay for out going out of the cloud, what we call egress, a bandwidth. And it's different depending on where it goes. Oh, so like different zones might cost more uh, or from one zone to another so zone crossing in another regions, region? So crossing regions, you know, um, cost a little bit of money, not as much. And then getting out of cloud entirely, like, so if, you, if you've got traffic going to the United States or to Asia or Europe, there's a slightly different rate for each. It seems like there's a lot of different moving pieces and parts. You touched on that earlier. How do I actually go about estimating what it's going to cost for me or how much of, you know, machine type one I'm going to need and machine type two, different tiers of service? How do, how do you go about estimating that? I have to unfortunately admit this is actually kind of hard to do, um, partly because there are so many moving pieces and, you know, like a straight up multiply it out in a spreadsheet is a way overestimate. So how do we get more accurate? Um, one of the things we can do, if you've got a really good understanding of a workload, we have a, an online calculator that includes all of our discounts and all the different services, and you can kind of fill it all in and you'll get a solid estimate of what that would cost. Um, unfortunately, it's kind of difficult to get to that level of knowledge of a system without running the system. Um, and so what, you know, what tends to be the most accurate is to run a mini version of the system and log and monitor that and you know, kind of do a spike you know, for either a shorter amount of time or with fewer machines, just to see what is actually all of the moving pieces. And then you can use that as a base to multiply and estimate from. That actually makes a lot of sense. Um, I guess one thing I'm curious about, though, because it makes sense that uh, if I'm only spinning up machines that I'm mostly utilizing, I'm going to save money in that way. What about if I have uh, machines that are running for a long time, though, or if I'm close to utilization, because it seems like this is a rental type model where I'm renting, 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 and never really owning. Are there any kind of savings? Absolutely. There's a, a whole bunch. Um, and I, I think the, the main thing is, um, and this is, this is, you know, you're a Kubernetes guy. Like why do containers exist at all? Like I think it's to try to get high utilization on the host machines so that you get the most work, you know, and the container keeps each app in its own space. So you can put a lot of different things on the same box and run the box, you know, at 80% instead of five, things like that. So we have an extra tool in cloud VMs where you can, instead of trying to fit a lot of pieces in one box, you can change the shape of the box. So you, if you have a workload that is very RAM intensive or very CPU intensive, you can change the shape of the machine to fit your actual process. I actually like that a lot. Uh, I'm going to throw in a random example, but if I was packing a backpack, it's like if I can change the shape of the dividers, I can fit more in instead of trying to find odd-shaped items that fit into the backpack. So that's kind of one of the benefits you get in the cloud, and that still lets you pay less because, again, you're utilizing less space overall. And those shapes... Okay, that and, makes sense. Yeah. But that doesn't really... Well, I was going to say, that doesn't really touch on the, yeah, the rental okay. kind of so model, to, like uh, this idea that we're paying a lot, but we're never really owning the machine. To kind of address that more directly, um, you know, it is always going to be a rental, but, you know, when you're using it for a long time, it's more efficient. And so we automatically offer what we call a sustained use discount when that uh, is the case. So if you're running the same kinds of CPUs, it doesn't even need to be the same machine, the same kinds of CPU over time, we'll automatically give you a discount of up to like around 30%. And then if you know so there's a big deal there. And then if you know you've got that kind of base workload over a long period of time, you can essentially kind of reserve that, a committed use discount to pay ahead and get an even bigger discount on that. Okay, so there's a lot of savings there. There was another one. I did a quick scan. I did a quick look. And, and this one blew my mind. I do not understand it at all. They were called preemptible VMs. Absolutely. Can you tell me about those? So if you imagine, you know, we were talking about this Tetris problem, trying to fit things in. You've got a data scanner data center scale version of that. Um, and so if we can uh, run machines in the corners, it's useful. Um, so, but we need to stay flexible. So we, we offer a machine preemptible type or like a preemptible mode basically that fits in there. So if you know that you have a workload that is either relatively quick or that can be restarted, you can run it there and run it at like a fifth of the cost. 
A fifth of the cost? Twenty percent of the cost. So the only difference between a preemptible and a regular machine is that it's guaranteed never to last more than twenty four hours. It will stop, and it might turn off at any moment. So you have to be able to kind of restart your work. Okay, but for for the types of workloads that would fit for, that's a huge savings. I guess an, another thing I'm really interested in is on that is on that model. Again, I'm used to maybe use, using five percent, and now we're moving towards using eighty percent. Um, what happens if I'm not using anything at all for a little while or like, you know, I don't actually have That's any the, activity going the, on, you know, even better. So if you, if you stop a VM, you don't, you only pay for the disk usage and nothing for the actual CPU memory, uh, part of it. So you can stop it and then turn it back on whenever you want. Um, and you can even do that on a schedule. So if you know, like three days a month, this machine needs to be working, you can schedule that ahead of time. Oh, Wow. Okay, then what about for things that I don't like? I like I can't predict per se uh, a spike in traffic for some sale or something that went on. Some celebrity mentioned my product. Is there any way to yeah, handle that? So the most that? common pattern there, I think, is uh, groups of machines that are running kind of the same image that work together and all live behind a load balancer. So you've got traffic coming into one place and gets kind of spread across a couple of computers, and then you get more traffic and you add a few more computers, less traffic, you you turn them off. So the the managed instance group can actually auto scale the size of the group based on load or metrics that you define. And again, you're only paying once those VMs start up. They're on and they exist. Wow, okay, so to recap, because this actually seems really cool and it's changed the way I think about uh, pricing and cost because before I was buying for the next five years or so, plus playing for people to manage things, I was paying for networking and all the rest of that. And now with the cloud, it seems like you're really renting or buying for the next five seconds or so. What am I using right now? Okay, let me try to only pay for that. I agree, hundred percent. Does that sound like a good recall? Okay. So then, you know what? I kind of want to go and I actually try this out. I want to take my spreadsheet and I want to go and, and, and based on the different types of work, I want to see what discounts I can get. Uh, any any tips or like next steps that I should take? Yeah, I mean, yes, go do that. Start some VMs and see how they work. Um, but I want to let you know, there's actually, um, a free trial and a free tier to help you do that and experiment with cloud. So a trial and a tier, uh, please explain. So it's a little confusing. They're both T's and they both like free trial, free tier. Um, so everyone new to Google cloud gets a $300 coupon basically to use in 90 days for any service, any part of cloud they want to use it on. And in addition to that, there's a long running tier so the first little bit of usage for about 20 different products is free. And then only after that do we charge. And included in that is a, is a small VM that you can leave running uh, as long as you want. Oh, wow. All right. That is really cool. Uh, I'm going to have to go and check some of this out. Brian, thank you so much for coming Absolutely. in. If you're listening at home, uh, step number one is go try out the free tier or the free trial. And uh, anyone else... If you've been using Google Cloud for a while, if you know about pricing and cost, share some tips in the comment below for other folks that maybe aren't as experienced. I'll go through and read that. I think that'd be really helpful. Thanks for watching and thank you again, Brian.